The following broadcast is released under a Creative Commons license. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. I believe He lived and died, and that He rose again. I believe and trust in Him. Ascended into hell, Christ our living head will one day come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe and trust in Him. I will trust in my Redeemer, sing of His love. That lasts forever Know His hope And sure salvation I will trust in Him Though the world Falls around me I rest And know That He has found me Christ the rock Is my foundation Welcome all to Pastor Yeshua. You've been listening to Creed by Richard Jensen from his album Order of Service. By way of introduction, Pastor is an acrostic which stands for Preaching All Salvation Through One Redeemer. Our Redeemer, Yeshua, Jesus is the Hebrew name for the Lord. It means Yahweh, the Lord, is salvation. Translated from Hebrew into the Greek language, the name Yeshua becomes Jesus. The English spelling for Jesus is Jesus. This program deals with apologetics, questions on and about God, the Bible, and the Christian faith. I take questions and seek by scripture to give answers and encouragement for everyone, including the tough-minded living in today's skeptical society. And now, let's join Pastor Yeshua. Welcome to Pastor Yeshua. In part one of the last episode, we began discussing the core definitions, aspects, expectations, and destiny of the church as is revealed by God's Word, the Bible. You will recall that we initially asked four questions in an effort to resolve any misunderstandings about the nature and function of the church. Our goal was to further eliminate some of the confusion and to refocus our understanding to a correct biblical foundation and framework for Christ's church. In the first episode, we asked and answered the questions, 1. What is the biblical definition of the word church? And 2. How does God define his own church? In this episode, we will continue the discussion by asking and answering the remaining questions, 3. What are the biblical responsibilities of the church? And 4. What is the eternal destiny of the church? Thus, in this episode, the next question is question number 3. What are the biblical responsibilities of the church? You will recall that the above question was in contrast to the question from the world, quote, How does the church make itself palatable to the secular world? Unquote. You will hopefully also recall that this question was earlier mentioned to be synonymous with the sub-question, quote, Called to do what? Unquote, when we defined the word church from the original Greek word ekklesia, which means outcalled ones. Tragically, as so often the case, Satan has historically sought to subvert the purposes and mandates of God's church so as to draw away as many as possible from the faith, once and for all delivered to the saints. Sometimes the devices Satan uses are blatant and obvious, as in the case of the religious cults who have apostatized from the faith with their various heretical teachings. Other times the devices are subtle candy-coated, substituted with well-meaning worldly sentiments, emotional, feeling-oriented enticements, mystical experiences, or other accommodations designed to appeal to the flesh. Too often the church is defined as a success by standards such as how many people attend the church yearly, weekly, or monthly, how much money does the church receive, 
How large or ornate is the building? How many programs does the church offer? How popular or well-known is the pastor? Is the pastor on the radio? Admittedly, having these items in the church does not exclude the church from being healthy, but neither does having any or all of them indicate that the church is spiritually healthy, either. In order to judge the health, or lack thereof, of the church, one must ultimately look to scripture to determine terms and definitions. Since all men have the influence of sin and the flesh, God remains the final arbiter of the heart. Consequently, when we are talking about the health of the church, since we have established that the proper definition for God's church is the option A, church, the household of faith model comprised of individual believers, then God begins his diagnosis of the health of his church one heart at a time. As any given church expands and grows in number, the diagnosis by God of the overall whole of any group also grows on a sliding scale to include the various organized corporate elements of the group including the individual diversity and characteristics particular to that group. Thus, for example, one might find a group of two or more persons who have recently come to faith in one area who are relatively new in the faith. At the same time, there may be another group of two or more persons in another area who have been in the faith for a long time. Assuming the second, more mature group has significant issues of sin within its body, then as a whole, it is possible that God may seek to discipline this body and its members to improve their individual and overall health as a body. In this case, longevity and or seniority in the faith alone is not the sole determining factor. Conversely, as to the first group, God may see the group as very healthy and choose to bless them despite the relative youth of their faith. Thus, when it comes to the health, or lack thereof, of the type B church, there is not a one-size-fits-all formula. In the end, we have a foundation for the church exemplified by Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 18. Beyond this foundation, in general, we know that God is seeking to complete, sanctify, edify, unify each believer, as well as the whole, into the fullness and likeness of His Son, Jesus Christ. While complete sanctification is the ultimate goal, we will still expect to see various shortcomings present within individual believers, as well as the body which God is dealing with. As the church body grows, we may expect that there will exist a growing amount of believers who are at various stages anywhere from being called, to recently having come to the faith and being justified, to ever-increasing sanctification and maturity. At any stage in the process, it is critical to remember that all have the potential for falling prey to various types of sin. As the group expands, since sin is still present, the potential for errant or aberrant views grows. While there is no such thing as a perfect church this side of eternity, there are some benchmark elements which by tradition tend to demonstrate the spiritual health of the church. They are as follows. 1. Worship praise and honor of God. 2. Study of God's Word, the Bible. 3. Prayer for oneself, those of the house of faith by name, those who we know immediately, the body in general, and the unsaved. 4. To demonstrate the love of Christ by giving assistance, comfort, and encouragement to the body. 5. To partake in the blessings and commandments of new covenants of baptism and communion. 6. To practice submission to God's will and to be sanctified by faith according to His grace. 7. To seek out, submit, and equip oneself to those particular gifts and fruits of His Spirit which God would endow to each believer to serve the body or to evangelize the lost. 8. To contend for the faith once and for all delivered to the saints, and to be on guard against false teaching, heresy, and aberrant theology. 9. To provide discipline, reproval, admonishment, and restoration within the body with love as necessary to the health of the individual believer as well as the whole body. 10. Each member demonstrates a spirit of humility and servanthood towards their fellow servants in the body as well as submission to those who are appointed to authority in the body. All members should submit to the authority of the chief shepherd, Jesus Christ, as is articulated in Colossians chapter 1 verse 18. Quote, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, 
the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence, unquote. 11. The body should strive at all times to be unified together in thought, deed, and practice under the banner of Jesus. And finally, 12. To strive to engage each member to exemplify themselves as being salt and light to the world around them. Given the prerequisite of our desire to clearly understand and know what Scripture says within its context about a healthy church beyond the above elements, I would say that in general, a worthy goal is to find a church where there is a methodical and foundational reading and exegesis of the Bible in a verse-by-verse, chapter-by-chapter approach. The teacher and or pastor would do well to have a comprehensive understanding of Greek and Hebrew as well as a sound approach to applying the text in a biblical world view. Lastly, the church should teach and practice scripture as being the foundation and ruler of first and last appeal. As we discussed previously, the congregation must be responsible to do its individual homework, as did the Bereans, to, quote, search the scriptures, unquote, and not just sit around and assume that everything and anything presented to them is to be true without question. Unfortunately, the reality is that the kind of church above is found few and far between. We live in a drive-through, microwave culture where most Christians just want to show up, relax and hear warm and fuzzy things about Jesus or about philosophical issues such as living a good life in general. Or they just want to be entertained. Choosing and remaining at church is like watching television with a remote control. If our attention is not immediately wetted, we push the button on the remote control and continue changing channels until we see and hear what interests us. We also live in a time and age where the world would use any mechanism possible to eliminate God, the Bible, Jesus, His Church, or His teachings from their presence. If the world cannot eliminate these things from them, then the world would seek to compromise and conform God, the Bible, Jesus, and His Church, and or His teaching to appease the ways of the world. This is precisely what is warned in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, when it says, quote, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, unquote. The point of this verse demonstrates that God's word is truth and reality. God's word, according to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, quote, is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart." Because God's word is forever powerful to convict, to convert, and to complete man, man is left with making one of two choices, either repent or rebel. Sadly, many who call themselves Christians tend to be lazy and simply do not have the patience needed to study and show themselves approved. In many cases, the question needs to be asked, what would be the result if the average Christian spent one half of the time reading and studying scripture as they do watching television, playing video games, texting, or engaging in social media? If, for example, people carried and used the Bible with the same zealousness that they carry and use cell phones, one could only imagine what inroads would be made for the kingdom of God. Our conclusion is that the goal of the church is not to conform, subvert, submit, dumb down, or otherwise water itself down in order to get the world or those of the world to love or attend or approve of the church because the true church is defined as individuals who are called and separated from the world by Christ. The church then cannot abandon those elements of faith once and for all delivered to the saints in order to be relevant or palatable by the definition of the world from which it is separated. God, his word, and his church are alive, powerful, and relevant to the world today exactly as they were when spoken 2,000 years ago and there are no expiration dates on them. The great commission and purpose of the church has not changed. Then as is now, the purpose of the church is for its members to reach down and out into a world lost and cut off by rebellion and sin and speak the truth and love so as to rescue as many as possible through God's grace, power, and spirit. 
the purpose of each believer as well as the church is to be salt and light through their words and deeds to a dying world. The church must always continue to remain steadfast in prayer, hope, and faith, acting with the knowledge that God is not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to eternal life. The church and each member who is in the body of Christ must constantly remind themselves with all sobriety that the reality is that not everyone will choose to repent and receive Christ. In this context, the church serves as an example by which the world is to be judged according to its rebellion. In the end, the fact is, as stated previously, there are two groups, the sheep and the goats, those who repent and receive God's gift of eternal life through grace by faith in Jesus Christ, and those who choose to remain in rebellion and receive eternal separation and suffering as a result of their choice. Each of us who find ourselves positioned in Christ must remain vigilant as a member of his body to remember that one cannot serve God and mammon. Each believer and the church as a whole must be willing, able, and ready to say, as Joshua, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The last question is question number four. What is the eternal destiny of the church? Now remember, we are not discussing, quote, how effective is the worldly business model or success of the church, unquote. We should not be focused exclusively on issues like how large is the size of the church building, how many people are sitting in the building on any given service, how much money does the church accumulate. Instead, our focus needs to be what is the spiritual health of the church and ultimately what is the eternal destiny of the church. Yet despite the fact that the proper scriptural criteria are well known to many, it is still possible to find varying amounts of moderately secular to semi-heretical elements. The final verse of Matthew chapter 16 verses 13 through 18 gives a valuable insight regarding the responsibility of the church when it says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. As we look at this text, remember that, strategically speaking, gates have historically been defensive fortifications against an outside enemy or other danger. However, in this verse, Jesus promises that the gates of hell will not prevail against the building of his church. When Jesus talks about building, you will recall that we are not talking about building in the sense of the option A church, as if Jesus is referring to the construction of brick-and-mortar edifices. Even though today, in some places, church groups are cropping up on Sundays on every corner in every kind of building like gas stations in their heyday, this is not what Jesus is referring to. Instead, understood properly, instead, understood properly, the church, according to the option B model, was, is, and will continue to be built until Jesus returns according to the same pattern and method as when it was first started. Put simply, Jesus is saying that the gates of hell cannot and will not prevail against God's sovereign will to call, to draw, and to separate those who he wills to repentance, to justification, to sanctification, and to glorification according to his grace. Likewise, God will not force anyone to stop rebelling against him and thus condemn themselves to hell. According to scripture, hell is a place which was created for the devil, his angels, and anyone else who ultimately dies while in rebellion to God. Thankfully, God has made it clear that those who repent of their rebellion by placing their faith in Jesus Christ and his righteousness are already dead to sin and its consequences. Instead of the believer being separated from God by sin, the believer is a new creation separated from death, hell, and the grave by God's grace through faith. By this definition, the gates of hell, which were once destined to keep us separated from God because of our sin, no longer have any ability to prevent the believer from approaching God and being found justified by Jesus' righteousness. The conclusion is that fully comprehending and describing the eternal destiny of the church is difficult at best for the present, given the fact man perceives everything through the eyes of his carnal flesh. What we know of the church is correctly understood through revelation of God's word by his spirit. 
much of what is known about the church is given via types and parables found in scripture for example ephesians chapter 5 verses 22 through 32 gives us the believer a vantage point of the church as likened to marriage when it says quote, wives submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the lord for the husband is the head of the wife even as christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body therefore as the church is subject unto christ so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself.